welcome once again to our study in the unseen realm. Nice to see all of you here this evening. I kind of subtitled this lecture in my mind, How to Supercharge Your Worship. You know, everything you're learning in a Sunday school class, listening to sermons, doing your own Bible reading and study, is about informing us that we might bring a full-orbed worship before the Most High God. But all of us, we, we know, sometimes we get into the doldrums of, of the Christian life, you know, and things sort of slide along on automatic for a while, and we know we should worship, but we don't always with the same fervor that we do at other times. Tonight's lecture is about supercharging your worship. My prayer is that you would go bouncing into your church on Sunday morning and lifting up praise with the most elevated voice that you can, raising your hands and bringing the adulation and the worship that is due the Most High God. It's a privilege to be able to uh, preach these things and teach them to you. This is also the wrap-up lecture for this section that we've been working on. This is the fourth week now, Genesis chapter 6. What really happened in Genesis 6, 1 through 4. We'll be using this as a bridge as we move forward, but tonight is my, my objective is, is to seal the deal with you. you know, I mentioned to you, all of you are kind of like the jury. You know, or you're the Bereans. You're searching the scripture. These things really so. You know, tonight is when I'm going to try to pull it all together as we move into the New Testament and solidify this for you. So let's begin as we always do with prayer. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks once again for the opportunity to even study your word, Lord. When I think about the centuries of the church and for so many periods, long periods of time, it wasn't even accessible to common people, Lord. It wasn't in their own language. They were totally dependent on the clergy to be able to communicate what is in the scripture and now we have it. And here we are, we're studying it, we're looking into these things and we're trying to penetrate something that is here within the word of God and it raises our understanding of the awe and the worship that is due your throne, Lord. Because you are the most high God and worthy to be worshiped. I pray that everything this evening would work toward that end and leave us with a sense of inspiration and awe and wonderment that gives rise to voices lifted up, to informed prayer, passion and fervor in our service to you because of who and what you are and your designs that are so far above our earthly wisdom. So Lord, we humbly ask that you would join us in our study. Be our teacher this evening and may you be honored and glorified in what is examined this night. In Jesus' name, amen. I mentioned to you last week that we would be moving into the New Testament, and that is where we're headed. We're actually going back to week number one. During the introduction, I submitted you this first text that we're gonna examine. We didn't study it, we just looked at it there, but we're gonna begin here tonight. First Peter chapter three, 18 through 22. You see it on the screen. Hear the word of God. For Christ also died for the sins once for all, the just for the unjust, so that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which also he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, who once were disobedient, when the patience of God kept waiting in the days of Noah during the construction of the ark, in which a few, that is, eight persons, 
were brought safely through the water. Corresponding to that, baptism now saves you. Not the removal of dirt from the flesh, but an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who was at the right hand of God, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. That is our first text tonight. Let's open up this passage and see how the Holy Spirit would illuminate our understanding. So in this text, the first thing that expositors would pick up on is that Peter is using what's called typology here in the text. He is pointing to the idea of the flood of Noah in that the ark saved Noah as baptism now saves us. Now, we need to understand that when he mentions this in correspondence with one another, it is indeed the ark that became the, the vehicle by which Noah and his family were indeed saved. Baptism is a statement. It's a statement of a profession of faith and then a physical sign being placed on the believer or on a child that indicates a profession of faith that Christ is Lord and I need forgiveness of my sins. That's the part that needs to be understood here when he says it is baptism that saves you. It's not that the water saves anyone. It's the idea of someone coming forward and taking water upon them. I remember several years ago, many, many years ago, I was in discussions, uh, I was in a committee meeting at the presbytery level and there was a discussion that came up about a missionary who was talking about how difficult it is to do evangelism in the Mideast region. You can, might imagine the difficulty that would be there with that. And uh, as we were talking, we were talking about people that were new converts. And I said, well, how do you handle baptism? And this individual said, well, we don't do that. And I said, you don't? He said, no, we don't do that. If we, they do that, if they take on that water, that could really mean all kinds of trouble. I mean, they might be ostracized from their family, they could lose their job, etc. And I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, wait a minute. You know, the Lord Jesus Christ said that we are to go and preach the gospel to all nations, teaching them all that I, to observe all that I commanded you, and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Baptist, if a person is a believer, they indeed should be baptized. I mean, it doesn't make sense that somebody could be a Christian and set baptism aside for whatever reason. And I certainly don't want to minimize what that might mean in the Mideast, taking water onto yourself. I understand that. That's a pretty heavy thing. But it's always been a heavy thing. Throughout the history of the church, it's been a heavy thing. So that's the sense here of the typology. But that's not the objective of the lesson tonight. The issue here is regarding the statement in verse 19 in which he went and made proclamation to the spirits now in prison, coupled with verse 22, having gone into heaven after angels and authorities and powers had been subjected to him. Now Edmund Clowney who used to be at Westminster, I believe, he wrote on this, and he displays the difficulty the commentators have if they do not hold a supernatural view of Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4. Clowney writes, he says, Peter writes about Christ preaching to spirits in prison. His words were no doubt clear to those who first heard them but they have been hard for later generations to understand. Martin Luther writes in his commentary, and he's now quoting Luther, a wonderful text this is, and a more obscure passage perhaps than any other in the New Testament, so that I do not know for certainty just what Peter means, end quote of Luther. Clowney continues, study of the passage may have progressed since Luther's day, but his confession still warns us against overconfidence. 
The difficulty in understanding verse 19 and verse 21 becomes clear when one realizes that Peter is referencing an older event. Expositors who do not hold to a supernatural view of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, avoid this understanding. On the screen, Scott McKnight in the NIV application commentary puts it this way. After analyzing the evidence myself, mostly in preparation for classes, class lectures at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School, fine school in, uh, near Chicago, where students are quick to challenge a professor's points of view. I came to gr- agree with those who thought that Peter was utilizing a view about spirits that was current in Judaism of his time. Inheriting this tradition probably from First Enoch, a Jewish pseudopigrapha. Peter adds color to it by having Jesus announce his victory over the netherworld in his exaltation to the Father. Beyond this, Peter H. Davids. Now, he writes in the New International Commentary of the New Testament, highly respected across theological lines, very well-known commentary. Most pastors that are serious about study of the Scripture probably have this commentary. There's multiple authors for different books of the Bible. There's one editor when they put it all together. Peter H. Davids writes on this because he's dealing with 1 Peter. He says, quote, A reading of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, especially as used by Jews of Peter's day, makes it clear that these sons of God were associated with Noah and interpreted as angels who had disobeyed God and were subsequently put in prison. In 1 Enoch, for example, Enoch sees a place of imprisonment and is told, these are among the stars of heaven that have transgressed the commandments of the Lord and are bound in this place. Here then we have an event that includes all of the elements to which Peter refers, spirits, and he puts in parentheses here, angels, stars, watchers, and spirits are used interchangeably by first Enoch that were disobedient, that is, the transgressed the commandment of the Lord and were therefore put in prison. This place is a prison house of the angels. They are detained there forever. Christ there, therefore then joined, journeyed to this prison. And he continues to write here, he says, um, in the New Testament, the Greek term here for kariso, which is to proclaim, nor- normally refers to a proclamation of the kingdom of God in the gospel, but on a few occasions retain its secular meaning of pro- to proclaim or announce. To announce. The idea here is that Jesus is not going down to preach to people the gospel. He is there to make a proclamation. And the proclamation is, I did it. I won and you failed. Now some have resisted a watcher interpretation of 1 Peter because the tradition would have been unfamiliar outside of Judaism. Some have remarked this, said look, Hey, the New Testament was impacting the Roman Greco world. They weren't all Jews. They wouldn't have all known about Enoch. Well, Karen Jobes, Jobes is interesting. Uh, She was selected to write the commentary on 1 Peter in the Baker exegetical commentary, another highly academic commentary. Jobes got a PhD from Westminster. She writes on this. She says, Peter's allusion to the tradition of the watchers does not necessarily require a literary knowledge of the book of First Enoch. The book of First Enoch may preserve a tradition that was more widely known. And she gives this example. Many people today who are familiar with the concept of purgatory 
are neither Roman Catholic nor able to cite any of the doctrines of the church that teach this. Only a general knowledge of the role of evil spirits in Noah's flood story would have been sufficient to make Peter's point. For those who knew the Enoch, Noah tradition of the condemnation of the watchers and the evil spirits that came from their prodigy, Peter's point is that Christ's resurrection and ascension have given him victory over them and that the evil they incited on earth, whether Jew or Gentile, were familiar at least with Noah's tradition. Let me give an example. Okay, how many of you were formerly Roman Catholic? All right, put your hands down. For those of you that were never Roman Catholic, how many of you, let me see your hands, have ever heard of purgatory? See, you all have. Okay. Everybody's heard of that. But you don't know everything about the church that they taught about it, but you are familiar with it. You have a general understanding. That's Job's point here as she writes on this, that it wasn't necessary that everybody knew the Jewish pseudepigrapha named First Enoch to understand what was going on. It was generally understood. In addition to this, the New Testament never speaks of an evangelism of dead spirits. Yet it does speak of Christ's triumph over evil entities and the powers of darkness. Look on the screen. 2 Corinthians 2.14. I should have boldfaced the key word here. But thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph. That's the key word here. Triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of the knowledge of him in every place. Keep that word triumph. Now, Colossians 2, verse 15, Paul writes, When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them, having triumphed over, uh, uh, over them through him. Okay, so this is what Jesus is doing. He goes to the cross. First, he's born, right? He comes as the second Adam. Where the first Adam failed, the second Adam comes and does everything that God told him to do. In the case of Adam, he was told not to do one thing, and that's the very thing he did, and plunged himself and his prodigy into sin and were ejected from the garden. Jesus then comes, I'm using Paul's language out of Corinth, as a second Adam, he first actively obeys God. He does everything according to the law, everything God told him to say, he said, everything that God told him to do, he did. That's the act of obedience of Christ. But then, at the end, he needs to deal with the passive obedience that God had called him to, which meant that he would passively accept being put on a cross and receive the blows of God for the sins of the seed of the woman. He passively submitted to that. So he both actively and passively obeyed. And then he dies. And at that point, he descends. And he looks them right in the face and says to them, I won. I did it. I did it. David's, Peter David's in his commentary, I'm continuing to read. It's on the screen. Thus, it seems likely that this passage in 1 Peter refers to a proclamation of judgment by the resurrected Christ to imprison spirits, that is, fallen angels, sealing their doom as he triumphs over sin and death and hell and redeeming human beings. It is precisely this contrast between the spirits and the human beings that occupies the next step of the argument. The angels were disobedient to God. While not totally clear from Genesis 6, it is very clear in 1 Enoch 6. And with them in time, of the deluge, the majority of people. 
Edmund Clowney, I said to him earlier, he doesn't hold to a supernatural view. He wrestles with this back and forth. I'm going to be doing a lot of reading out of my notes tonight, a lot of quotes. I want you to see all the scholarship that's in here. He remarks, part of this will be on the screen, it would be a great mistake to read into 1 Peter, now listen to the language here, the fanciful descriptions of 1 Enoch. But the use of 1 Enoch in Jude 14 and 15 and the passage about the doom of fallen angels in 2 Peter 2, 4, we're going to deal with these in just a few moments, show us that the language of the Enoch literature could help us to understand the terms used in 1 Peter. Since the disobedient angels and their offspring were viewed as instigators of the lawlessness in the antediluvian world, it might be possible to speak of them in those who disobeyed long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, quoting 1 Peter. Peter's word for preached means, quote, herald or proclaimed. It could carry the meaning of announcing judgment rather than offering salvation. In view of the description of Christ's victory in 3 verse 22, that meaning is possible here. Christ preaching to the spirits in prison would be his proclamation to the angels, authorities, and powers of his resurrection victory and their doom. <laughs> but yet he continues. He can't quite go there. He continues, it is a proclamation of God's righteousness and therefore the need of repentance. That message was addressed through Noah to those disobedient sinners during their lifetime. The passage describes no second choice. So in his mind, and I've seen this done in other commentaries, they try to, they try to take what's going on in 1 Peter and link it back somehow to the preaching of Noah in his day to the people that were there at the time, calling them to repent and building the ark as a testimony. You better turn around because the day's coming when you're not going to be able to swim that long. His earlier understanding of it, I think, though, was correct. He's saying here that first Enoch would grant a lot of understanding here. It would carry the meaning of announcing a judgment rather than offering of salvation. It fits. Okay, so when you talk about like Reformed theology and evangelicalism, one of the recent multi-volume commentaries that has come out started published probably at least 10 or 12 years ago, is the Reformed Expository Commentary. It's the newest one. It's not complete. There are multiple authors, one, a couple of general editors, editors, and they slowly release this over time. First Peter has been out for a while. The writer there is Dan Duriani. And while commenting on 1 Peter chapter 3, he notes that the imprisoned spirit's identity, he puts it this way, they could be fallen angels, perhaps those mentioned in Genesis 6 and imprisoned by God in 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6. This last option that Jesus made a proclamation to fallen angels is most widely adopted for several reasons. Now, I want to work through Doriani's reasoning here. Dan Doriani, let me give you some background on him. He's a council member for the Gospel Coalition. It's very respected. You'll see all kinds of things online. He's a PhD from Westminster. He pastored a church, Central Pres, in St. Louis for a number of years. It was part of the denomination of this church. Now he's working full-time as a seminary professor at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis. That's the flagship school of the Presbyterian Church of America, which is a different denomination. Nonetheless, he's a reformed writer, highly respected. Here is his reasoning on this, because he is on board with the supernatural view of Genesis 6. Here's his reasons. Number one, the word spirits, which is plural, always refers to non-human spiritual beings unless it's qualified. Deceased human souls, that would be the Greek word suke, refers exclusively to deceased humans. Typically, spirits refers to evil spirits or fallen angels. And I added to this Simon Kistemacher in his commentary, Scripture nowhere states that souls of men are kept in prison. Duriani's second argument is this. 
that in 1 Peter's time, the most common Jewish understanding of Genesis 6 held that fallen angels played a great role in the corrupting of humans in Noah's day. These fallen angels are prominent in 1 Enoch. And finally, he notes that the word prison probably does not refer to hell. Many other terms are used by New Testament writers for the location of the dead. It seems wise to take prison as a metaphor of God's control over these evil spirits. If you hold a supernatural view, 1 Peter 3 makes sense. Jesus triumphed over them. We have a time marker there. It's in the days of Noah. It's in the text. So we don't, it's, what period of time was it? It's connected to Noah. It's right there at that period of time. And Jesus descends while they're in bars, locked up wherever, and is in their face, triumphing over them. But that leads us on to text two and text three. First note, just about all commentators assert that Jude and 2 Peter are interdependent. That is, either Jude is borrowing from 2 Peter or 2 Peter is borrowing from Jude. Additionally, both borrowed from a shared tradition. Let's read it. Jude 6. Remember, there's only one chapter in Jude, so all we have are the numbers there for verses. Verse 6, And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he is kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. See how this makes sense? No one knows what to do with this if you don't have a supernatural view of Genesis 6. 2 Peter adds, chapter 2, verse 4, For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to the pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Now, again, we're not talking about all the powers of darkness here. This is a group that did something, and that group is locked up. Furthermore, I want you to note the correspondence that both Jude and Peter have with First Enoch. You've heard a lot about the book. There are actually two books of Enoch, who was the great-grandfather of Noah, and he did not see death. We know that from Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. First Enoch is also known as the Ethiopian book of Enoch, Second Enoch is also known as the Slavonic book of Enoch. The books are dated somewhere between 300 and 200 BC. It's that intertestamental period of time, otherwise known as the second, second Temple period. The content regarding the divine rebellion is also recorded in a book known as Jubilees and Hasia's Theogony. Both Aramaic and Greek fragments were found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they had prominence in first century Judaism. Regarding Jude's connection to Enoch, going back to Peter David's, again, International Theological Commentary, he says this, did Jude then consider this, first Enoch, is it scripture to be like Genesis or Isaiah? Well, certainly he did consider it authoritative, a word from God. We cannot tell whether he ranked it alongside other prophetic books like Isaiah or Jeremiah. What we do know is, first, that other Jewish groups, most notably those living in Qumran near the Dead Sea, also used and valued First Enoch. But we do not find it group with the other scriptural scrolls, okay? So, in other words, it's not included with the Bible, the canon that we have in the Old Testament, but it is included as additional information that they viewed as valuable. 
Now, some commentators have asserted that Peter was writing about angels who were rebelled with Satan. But somehow, what Peter is talking about here is this, that main time when Satan led a number of them into rebellion, and they, they went and followed him. John Tab Tabai, he writes on this. He says, if the angels cast into hell, or this prison, it's called Tartus, are yet free to roam then Peter's argument is significantly weakened. For the certainty of the judgment of the apostles in verse 9 is based on the historical fact that God has already punished the sinning angels and will deliver a future punishment as well. So we can't be talking about all of the hosts of, of the powers of darkness because we all know they were around at the time of Christ. The, the apostles were dealing with them. Paul says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against these powers and rulers, right? They're still there. This is a specific group. Now, to make this more clear, I put together this chart. Look at it on the screen. I'm trying to show the interdependence of Jude and 2 Peter with 1 Enoch. So let's take 2 Peter for a moment. See it on the left. For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them to hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. Verse 5. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness. Compare that to Jude 5 and 6. Now I desire to remind you, and then he gets into it, verse 6. Angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. Okay, you see the connection there. Now let's compare it to 1 Enoch 10. This is where the, the angelic host, those loyal Elohim, are instructed on how to handle the lesser Elohim. Bind his associates who have, been, who have united themselves with women. Bind them fast for 70 generations in the valley of the earth till the day of judgment and the prison in which they shall be confined forever. There's an interdependence there. Now, neither one is quoting the other one exactly, but the thoughts are all the same. The clearest reading of the New Testament writers indicates that first Enoch is the original source. There's not a lot of dissent about that. This does not mean that all of first Enoch is inspired, but these authors held that parts were indeed inspirational or at least authoritative on background information. That's exactly what we looked at last week when I highlighted to you the number of times the Old Testament says, if you want more information on this, go to this book or go to that book. We don't even know what they are. They haven't survived. But nonetheless, there they were. In addition to Enoch, the book of Jubilees is another one of these intertestamental books, and it notes a supernatural view of Genesis 6 as well, and the imprisonment of lesser Elohim for the transgression. Jubilees is often called the lesser Genesis because it is close dependence upon the book of Genesis. The book is generally dated to the middle of the second century B.C., Tim Chaffee makes a point on this. He says, based upon the number of manuscripts found among the Dead Sea Scrolls and its use by numerous early church fathers, we can conclude that Jubilees was well known during the New Testament times, along with Enoch. It is often included in the canon of the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, end quote. What does Jubilees say? You've got it on the screen. Chapter 5. And when the children of men began to multiply on the surface of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the angels of the Lord saw in a certain year that of Jubilee that they were good to look at. And they took wives for themselves from all those whom they chose, and they bore children for them, and they were giants." And injustice increased upon the earth, and all flesh corrupted its ways. Do you remember last week? Man and cattle and beasts and birds and everything which walks on the earth. And they all corrupted their way and their ordinances. And they began to eat one another. 
and injustice grew upon the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of mankind was thus continually evil. The second quote from Jubilees says this, And against his angels, whom he had sent to the earth, he was very angry. And he commanded that they be uprooted from their domain. And he told us to bind them in the depths of the earth. And behold, they are bound in the midst of them, and they are isolated. Now, in a previous lesson, number five, week five, we were dealing with how Satan got his name. And I pointed out to you there's an evolution during the intertestamental time between some names that are used for the prince of darkness that later becomes Satan himself. That one name was Mastema. We spent some time talking about that. I want to come back to a quote that I used in lesson five. I'm quoting now. This, is, this too is, uh, I believe, out of Jubilees. And the Lord our God spoke to us, this would be the archangels, so that we might bind all of them and the chief of the spirits, Mastema, came and said, O Lord Creator, leave some of them before me and let them obey my voice and let them do everything which I tell them because if some of them are not left for me, I will not be able to exercise authority over of my will among the children of men because they are intended to corrupt and lead astray before the judgment because of the evil of the sons of men is great. And he said, this would be God, let a tenth of them remain before him, but let nine parts go down to the place of judgment. Continuing, all of the evil ones who were cruel, we bound in a place of judgment, but a tenth of them we let remain so that they might be subject to Satan upon the earth. Okay, so when the same Almost the two paragraphs there. It starts as Mastema. It ends with Satan. This is part of this evolution. By the time you get to the New Testament, it's just all Satan, right? What I'm calling to your attention right now is there's some kind of discussion that happened here. God's judgment is coming down on these angels who did not keep their abode. They committed this. And Mastema, Satan, intervenes and says, look, you know, I, this is my domain is this world. Did not Paul say Satan is the God of this world, right? I, I need some of these guys. So God's judgment was one-tenth, okay, one-tenth. The rest of them to, are to be bound. Now, this may be part of the answer perhaps, why we see this happen again later. Now, right now, we're all before the flood. But this problem of the sons of God becoming more and more interested in the daughters of men and then begatting a, freak of ra a race of freaks happens again. And we're going to look at that. And perhaps, perhaps, this is part of the genesis of this. Or it could be that there was another major defection out of the heavenlies. We're not there yet. We're coming to it later on. Still trying to buttress this. So we've got Enoch. We've got 1 Peter 3. We've got 2 Peter 2. We've got Jude. We're looking at all these texts. I want to read you several scholars. I've got so much background in this. You know, you can look at my notes. I mean, for the sake of time, I can't read all of it. But some of it, I, I want to bring to your attention. This is Richard J. Buchanan. Just sit back and listen. This is the word biblical commentary. Again, this is no novice commentary. I mean, these are serious scholars. Buchanan writes, he says, originally, the fall of the watchers was a myth of the origin of evil. But by the first century AD, its importance was largely already waning as the origin of evil was now focused rather on the fall of Adam. This is no doubt why there are a few allusions to it in the New Testament. But 
It was still widely known and accepted, especially in those Jewish Christian circles where the Enochian literature remained popular. Perhaps it was largely owing to the influence of those circles and the continuing popularity of Enoch literature in the second century tradition longer than Judaism. Jude's reference is directly, he writes, dependent on 1st Enoch 6, which is the earliest extant account of the fall of the watchers. And he shows himself closely familiar with those chapters. They tell how in the days of Jared, Jared, you read about him, Genesis chapter 5, verse 18, 200, now listen to this, he's summarizing 200 angels under the leadership of Shimahaza and Azel, filled with lust for beautiful daughters of men, descended on Mount Hermon. We are going to spend time on the geography of northern Israel. And what we're going to find, it's spook central of the ancient world. <laughs> they descended on Mount Hermon and took human wives, their children, the giants, that is, ravaged the earth, and the fallen angels taught many forbidden knowledges and all kinds of sin. I didn't labor that, but there's listing of things that they taught, including sensuality regarding females dancing, females and how they should actually put their makeup on so that they would look more appealing. Now, can you imagine this? This is actually written out. Jude's intention in stressing here the peculiar sexual offenses of both the Watchers and the Sodomites is probably to highlight the shocking character uh, which belongs to the same tradition as Jude here. The sun, the moon, the stars do not change their order, so should you not change the law of God by orderliness. In other words, they were, should have been in the proper abode. They were not of this life but they stepped over the line. They didn't keep it. D.A. Carson, huge, very respected scholar, writes, however we understand the sons of God in Hebrew in regards to Genesis chapter 6, 1 to 4, the Septuagint, Greek translation of the Old Testament, refers to them as angeloi, angels. Which word is picked up in both Jude 6 in 2 Peter 2, 2 4.0, in the New Testament, it is always used of angels and rarely of messengers. Let me repeat that. In the, in, in the New Testament, it is almost always used of angels and rarely to messengers. See, that's the thing with the word angelos in Greek, it can mean a messenger. It can, do, it can mean that in uh, Hebrew too. Um, or it can actually be designated actually for an angelic being. And he notes here, and it is never of aristocratic figures such as kings and nobles. Remember, that was one of the explanations of Genesis 6. Oh, they were actually kings and they married outside of their order and that became all these problems and that still remains as the Jewish position to this day. F.F. F. Bruce. The fallen angel view is drawn from non canonical books such as First Enoch, although the basis of the apocryphal details may well have been Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Such apocryphal books were evidently well known and appreciated by Jude's readers, and so he could confidently appeal to them as well as to the scriptural books of this sort that might not be truly inspired nor authoritative, but their moral lessons in particular were wholesome and worth heeding. Like Jude, Peter uses three well-known examples of God's punishment of the wicked. And he goes on. He talks about the angels who sinned here, etc. I have more. Uh, just for time, I'll, I'll, hold, I'll hold up. Uh, here's one. Uh, I've got it on the screen. Norman Hiller. Hiller writes on this point, Understanding the Bible Commentary series. He says, quote, The second warning example from the Old Testament concerns the sin and the fate of fallen angels. They became disgruntled with their positions of authority. Their lofty station, Jude says, the angels did not keep. They failed to do their duty in guarding something of great value. They were not single-minded in maintaining the exclusive position for which God had purposely created them. 
They chose to look elsewhere and abandoned their home. They deserted in order to further their own needs. Let me stop there. Remember, when Jesus is talking about this in the New Testament and it says, well, we'll be like the angels in heaven, they, need, they don't marry. Remember, I said to you, in heaven, they don't. What we're talking about is what happened here. He continues, Jude combines the two ideas. First, the angels deserted their appointed place of authority and to go to a, uh, after a position not intended for them. Second, they abandoned their proper domain to cohabitate with beautiful women on earth. Such notions may sound bizarre to modern ears, but their implication is plain. Pride and lust ruined the angels fell, and they fell. The evil interlopers, Jube warns his readers against, are equally guilty of pride and lust. Their judgment is as certain as that which befell those angels despite their exalted status. The angels who defected have been sentenced to be kept in darkness, bound with everlasting chains. Hold on to that, that word, darkness. We are not intended to imagine a literal dungeon in which fallen angels are fettered. Rather, Jude is vividly depicting the misery of their conditions. Free spirits and celestial powers as once they were and now shackled and impotent. Shining once, once enjoyed the marvelous light of God's glorious presence are now plunged into profound darkness. Remember I said to you that something that is indicative of the sons of God, watchers, these angeloi, shining lights, stars, brightness. And here they are, plunged into darkness. Douglas Moo, again, NIV commentary, well-known expositor. He writes here, he says, this tradition was not simply made up from whole cloth. The writers were elaborating on Genesis 6, 1 to 4. A passage that tells us about the sons of God who were attracted to the daughters of men, married them, had children with them. In the Jewish tradition, we are referring to the sons of God were angels and their cohabitating with women was a basic reason why, God's judge, why God judged the world in Noah's day. Everything had been corrupted. Now I want you to see and understand how serious this is. We've got to look at our own times that we're living in. In other words, these beings are so incredibly lost. It wasn't enough just to transgress the proper bounds here, take on a human form, get involved with women, begat children, begat a race. It's more than that. And as I said earlier, that... They're learning. They're teaching all kinds of practices. These writings are enumerating all these things that were de degraded society. They were eating one another. You remember your Old Testament history? When the spies were sent into Canaan? What's one of the things they said? There's giants, and they devour one another. How about John MacArthur? He writes, according to Jude 6, they, that is the angels, entered men who promiscuously cohabitated with women. Apparently this is a reference to fallen angels of Genesis chapter 6 who left their normal estate and lusted after women. End quote. MacArthur's Study Bible. Dick Lucas, Christopher Green. Jude is more likely referring to the strange incident of Genesis 6. The angels have some positions of authority, areas that God given responsibility, but they were not satisfied with the role that God had given them, and they infringed the boundaries in intermarrying with humans. We could keep going here. The Interpreter's Bible. How about Francis Schaeffer? Let's come back to Schaeffer for a minute. Okay, I already quoted him once. Here's a little more. What has stirred men's curiosity is the book of Jude. The book of Jude seems to refer to this. In verses 6 to 7, and angels, 
that kept not their own principality, but left their proper habitation, he has kept in everlasting bonds under the darkness until the judgment of the great day. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, having in like manner given themselves over to fornication and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example of suffering the punishment of eternal fire. This passage seems to say that there are angels who left their proper place and are specifically under judgment because they acted like the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. What happened with Sodom and Gomorrah? Last week, strange mixture. This all originates with the sons of God. They perpetrated a strange mixture. And they continue to teach that. This is, as the people of Sodom and Gomorrah sought other flesh in homosexuality, these angels sought flesh that was other flesh. They involved themselves with human women in what could be called fornication. This is further interest along this line if one understands this is a commingling of the angelic and the human. For then it is possible that it was the original historic source of an element common in mythology. Now, Schaefer at this point is making the point. This is str- you hear this in a lot of different myths around the globe. And the point here is, this is not trying to press the world into the scripture, it's just an acknowledgement. The scripture is acknowledging something that everybody else knows is going on. There is further interest, let me continue, there is further interest along this line that if one understands this as a commingling of the angelic and the human, for then it is possible that it was the original historic source of an element of common mythology. There we are. More and more we are finding that mythology in general, though greatly contorted, very often has some historic base. And the interesting thing is that one myth that one finds over and over in many parts of the world is that somewhere a long time ago, supernatural beings had sexual intercourse with natural women and produced a special breed of people. This is Francis Schaeffer. Such a notion is further strengthened in 6.4. There were giants, Nephilim, in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same therefore that the mighty men which were of old men of renown might be historical reality behind these myths. I have more here. How about the Baptist, A.W. Pink? These sons of God then appear to be angels who left their own habitation, came down to earth, and cohabitated with the daughters of men. The reference in Jude 6 to the angels leaving their own habitation appears to point and to correspond with these sons of God, angels, coming into the daughters of men. Apparently, by this means, Satan hoped to destroy the human race the channel through which the seed of the woman was to come. Then I tell you, it was a two-pronged attack. The battle plan had two parts. Annihilate them. Kill them. But if that doesn't work, we'll corrupt the seed. Arnold Frutenbaum, a Jew, completed Jew, he writes on this. Edwin Bloom, these are in my notes, you can look it up online, Paul Gardner. But here's one I actually embedded in your notes. Okay, so when I went to school, I went to, my seminary education was done at Reformed Theological Seminary, RTS as it's known. The home campus is in Jackson, Mississippi. But the school really expanded, and so now it's got like six or seven different campuses across strategic places in the United States. One of the early campuses they opened was Orlando. That is where I went to school. 
The Old Testament professor that was there at the time was Richard Pratt. I've quoted him in some of the places that we've been. Um, I, this was talked about in class. Pratt basically said, it's possible. Okay, but that's as much as time that was given to it. It was possible. I graduated in 1999. It was shortly around that time that Richard Pratt left RTS. He founded Third Millennium. You can look it up online. His goal was, was to come up with a theological plan for a two-year program and put it into five different languages and make it free online. And he did it. I mean, it's, you know, it's in Spanish, it's in Arabic, it's in Chinese, it's, you know, and he got himself as well as others to put this together. It's a huge thing and it's, it's a wonderful thing and it's great. Okay, he leaves. I graduate in 1999, he goes. In 1999, the RTS campus brings on a new professor by the name of Mark Futato. Now, I have it in your notes. Sometimes it helps if you hear the same thing from someone else, okay? If you follow exactly, put into your search bar, what I have there in your lesson notes, okay? Uh, Mark D. for Furtado, course, the course is Joshua to Esther, comma, the land, part two, dash, the inhabitants, comma, lesson two, comma, lesson two, lecture two, comma, Reformed Theological Seminary, comma, September 1, 2020. Stop. If you put that in, you're going to come up to that lesson. Now, here's what's going on there. It's not about the unseen realm. What he's doing, he's in a lecture that deals with this course, Joshua to Esther. So he's working his way through, in the early parts, dealing with Joshua, going into the promised land. And what do you find in the promised land? You got a problem in the prom, oh, it's too high. You got a problem in the promised land because there are Nephilim in the promised land. Now we haven't gotten there yet. We gotta think, how did they get there? because everybody else was killed with the flood. We gotta deal with that. But nonetheless, he gets into that, and as he does, he opens up everything that I've been teaching. And this I am submitting to you to back up what I was saying at the beginning of this course, things are changing, okay? What in the past might have been a possibility or someone disparaging it, here is a new professor with high rank and standing at a reformed theological campus of the seminary, and he's teaching essentially everything I've been teaching you. Look, look the lecture up. You know, it's a podcast. I mean, you can just do the dishes, change the oil in your car, you know, just listen to it. It's, sometimes it's good to hear it from somewhere else. Here's my bottom line. Without a supernatural view of Genesis 6, 1 to 4, Jude, 2 Peter, do not make sense. Some have asserted that the quoting of 1 Enoch by Jude and 2 Peter was simply hypothetical for illustrative purposes. So they would submit, oh, a modern example would be a minister who would quote a portion of Star Wars to illustrate a biblical point. Ancient people did not, my response is this, ancient people did not have any tension in accepting and presuming the supernatural view. They assumed it, but we struggle with it. Jude and Peter were predisposed toward believing in a supernatural view. You look at it, you think of this, Don, I've been with you for four weeks now, I've been going over this. This is, I can't, this is, I can't believe this. It's because it's supernatural, that's why. I mean, how easy is it to believe? Jesus turned water, everyday water, into wine. I mean, do you realize how, how weird that sounds to people that don't know anything about Christ or the Christian church or any of the doctrines that we hold on that are dear? Are you serious? Water to wine? Feeding 5,000 people with a few loaves and some fish? calling forth a man to come out of the grave after he'd been in there for four days. Or how about healing all kinds of people from the countryside, from all little towns where everybody knew one another. And the scripture says, 
and they all were healed. But this is my ultimate. Okay. So, the Reformed expository commentary is the newest Reformed work that's out. It's in certain parts. And so the only thing that fit this particular study was Doriani's work on 1 Peter. Okay? That was the only one that was out. There wasn't anything on Jude. I really wanted to know about Genesis. I wanted to know about dumb numbers. I wanted to know about Deuteronomy. I wanted to know about Joshua. They're not printed yet. They're not done. Until they just released Genesis. Now let me tell you about this commentary for a minute. So I mentioned to you last week or the week before that the most influential teacher in my life was James Montgomery Boyce. James Montgomery Boyce was the pastor and theologian at 10th Presbyterian Church, Philadelphia. He was the founder of the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology. We trucked people from this church all over the country going to that conference. That's when I was really introduced after I got out of Bible school to really deeper theological training. A voice I, I really loved because he was a top flight theologian and yet was a pastor and was able to put that in language that people could understand in the pews. And I was very much attracted to that. When Boyce was in 10th Pres, he had two associate ministers. One was Philip Riken, and the other was Richard Phillips. Both of them, when Boyce, after he died, they left, and they both have been used of the Lord in mighty ways. Richard Phillips continues in leading the Philadelphia Conference on Reformed Theology. He's involved with that. He and Riken are editors of the Reformed Expository Commentary. So they're editors. They, they've written some of the commentaries, but they haven't written all of them. But they're editors of it, right? Richard Phillips just released two-volume set, Book of Genesis. I like both of them, and I've quoted them heavily over the years because I hear in them voice. And it makes sense because they worked under him for so many years. Phillips writes on this. He devotes in Genesis to Genesis 6, 1 to 4, a good two pages of wrestling with this whole issue. And this is what he writes. I noted that the expression sons of God can refer to the godly line. Yet the most direct reference of this phrase in Scripture is to the angelic court that attends upon God in heaven. A clear parallel is seen in Job chapter 1 and chapter, chapter 1 verse 6, which describes a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Without question, the Job reference speaks of angels, including both holy and fallen ones, as do references in Psalm 29, 1 and 89, verse 7. We looked at all these passages. While it is possible that the sons of God and the daughters of man refer to the Sethites versus the Canaanites, Gordon Wayman, he's quoting another commentator now, he's in the biblical word commentary, writes out, he says, is to say at the least an obscure way of expressing such an idea, the idea of the Sethites. Later he concludes this, in my judgment, writes Phillips, the view that sees the sons of God as Sethites who sinfully married the daughters of Cain would be the stronger argument given the overall context of Genesis chapter 4 and 6 except for the testimony of 2 Peter 2, 4 and Jude 6 and 7. Yet, we must allow that the New Testament to provide the final word on the Old Testament. In this case, while the interpretation is still not certain, the New Testament seems to identify the sons of God in Genesis 6 as fallen angels. He couldn't totally give himself over to it, but at the end he basically says, you gotta come down with the New Testament writers and what they're saying. It's changing. It's changing. Now, here is Pastor Don's top 10 list 
for why that must be a supernatural understanding of Genesis 6, 1 to 4. Okay? I don't have it in your notes. Flip your page over, write them down. Okay? Number one, the sons of God are identified as supernatural in Scripture. We looked at that. There are a number of phrases, either sons of God or sons of the Most High, similar kinds of phrases. We looked at a number of passages. A supernatural understanding of that fits every single one. But more importantly, some of them can't be understood any other way. You can't have men that are entering in the chamber before God with Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? There was a mankind wasn't there. Or where were you when I created the, the earth and made all these things when the sons of God worshiped? I mean, where was mankind in that? Number one, the sons of God are identified as supernatural in scripture. Number two, to identify the sons of God as Sethites requires an allegoric hermeneutic. You have to go with allegory. Okay? To identify the sons of God as Sethites requires an allegory hermeneutic. Now, here's the irony of this. When I went to school, with all the education I had, to this very day, every, every guy, every girl that's in a seminary that's evangelical or reformed, something that's orthodox, they're all learning, you don't use allegory for interpreting the Bible. Allegory was the problem through the whole medieval church and is not straightened out until you get to the Reformation. And then you have Luther and Calvin and Zwingli and others that are saying, we got to go with the whole clear understanding of what the text actually says. But the Orthodox, the Orthodox commentators give allegory a pass on Genesis 6, 1 to 4, because it can't be angels. It can't be. Yeah, you look at the curriculum of any school that's worth its thought, worth its stock, and, and see if in their hermeneutics classes, if they're, yeah, allegory is a good way to go. No one does that. Yes. Hermeneutic. H e r m e n e u t i c. Remember, I said that is a connection to the Greek god Hermes, who interpreted he interpreted the the rulings from the God Council <laughs> to humanity. Does this sound kind of? Yeah, but just like Schaefer was saying, you've got these myths that, you know. Okay, number three. The seed of the serpent motif is in play. Remember, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. The judgment is brought down on the serpent for his part in the fall. I will put judgment between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall crush your head and you shall bruise his heel. Okay? There's only going to be two kinds of people on the planet. The seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. There'll be two people groups. They're not necessarily biological. Although we do have some of that going on in Genesis 4 and 5. But they all didn't hold ranks. <laughs> you know? It's a spiritual thing. And so the design of the serpent, he knows that he is coming. Now, he doesn't know when, neither do we as the reader. He doesn't know how, but he knows whatever this he is going to do, that he's going to get in a fight with him, and he's going to receive a death blow. I said to you, the illustration I use all the time, I take a bat, I come up to you, I smash your ankle. Okay? You're going to be in a lot of pain, and you may not walk right the rest of your life, but you're not going to die. But if I take the same force and I apply it to your skull, you're dead. One blow is significant. The other one is mortal. Satan's plan at this point is, I've got two battle plans. A, we will annihilate seed of the woman. Genesis chapter 4, what happens? First murder, Cain kills Abel. And this becomes the theme. We get up to Genesis chapter 6 with what we're studying right now. And the text says, 
The violence was so great, right? Battle plan A, exterminate the seed of the woman. Battle plan B, if we can't exterminate it, let's pollute it. Let's corrupt it. Let's put the seed of the serpent in the seed of the woman. And we will see this in spades later on when we get into some historical books. Number four, the ancient Ugarit language confirms a supernatural view. I covered this with you. Ugarit was uh, Israel's northern neighbor. It's in today what we know as uh, Syria. The big find at Ugarit among the remains was a library of at least 1,400 different kinds of clay um, writings. The interesting thing about this is Eucharist writings predate Moses and the language is the closest to ancient Hebrew of any ancient Semitic language. And Eucharist has a god and his god happens to be known as El, which is an abbreviation for Elohim, right? And there are those that attend El known as the sons of El, sons of God, a holy council. And how many are in the holy council? Seventy. And we looked and studied this several lessons ago, the number of 70, how it comes up, interestingly enough, in the biblical record as well as the Jewish record of how things develop of oversight of the people of God. I'm sorry? Spell Eucharist and then U number four, Number uh, four. Uh, the spelling of Eucharist is U-G-A-R-I-T. Number four is the ancient Eucharist language confirms a supernatural view. We're trying to identify sons of God. Here is Israel's northern neighbor. They use the same language in dealing with divine beings. Steve. In Enoch 6, it said uh, 70 generations and that judgment would be final. What's a generation? I don't know exactly at the time of what all that men. It's interesting that it is 70, so it could be symbolic, because seven is a number of perfection. Because 70 follows with your... Anyway. 70 goes with that whole idea, too. You know, it fits with that number 70 comes up. Remember, it starts with Jethro's counsel to Moses. You can't, you got to have more elders doing this. Choose 70 men. And we looked at a number of occurrences of this. Even the Septuagint that we're quoting here, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, it's, it's written around this same period of time. It's the, it's the Bible that Jesus used and the apostles. It, it was translated by 70 men. Okay? All right. Number five. Number five. The pseudepigrapha confirms the supernatural view. I'll spell it for you again. P-S-E-U-D-E-P-I-G-R-A-P-H-A. -E -E the pseudepigrapha confirms the supernatural view. Remember, pseudepigrapha means false writing. We noted that it is confined to the author. In other words, there are pseudonyms that are written there, like, for example, Enoch or other people. They're, it's indicating these are not the people that actually wrote it. Okay? And I quoted you several, a couple scholars on this point to, to note that that doesn't mean you can write the book off. I mean, that was very common at the time that they put it of the author that really didn't write it, but there was something else that was in it that was recognized as being something that was a word from God. The pseudepigrapha would include Enoch, Jubilees. Jubilees references another book called the Book of Noah. That hasn't survived. And there are others in this. And they're all saying the same thing. Number six. Moses' emphasis against all unholy mixture confirms this view. We covered it last week. 
The unholy mixing creates corruption. And the powers of darkness are out to do anything to corrupt the image of man. And this relates to where we are right now. Everything that's going on behind the scenes that has to do with the corruption of the image of God is born out of hell. It's not new. This has been going on forever. Anything to distort the clearest understanding of God's handiwork in humanity, that man has created both man and woman, that they are according to their kind, that their sexual parts correspond to one another, that that is how procreation takes place. And this whole thing that is completely upside down now and accepted in the highest elite places within not only North American culture, but all around the globe, it's a mixing. It's a distortion. It's not new. Number seven. Lesser Elohim appeared as men and so human that they may be unrecognizable. So says the New Testament. Some of you have entertained angels and had no idea. We know, here you go. Lesser Elohim appear as men and so human that they may be unrecognizable. We noted that in the book of Genesis, they ate, they washed themselves, they rested, they laid hands on Lot and dragged him out. They're that human. If they have all those abilities and they always appear as men, is it that big of a bridge to understand that within the providence of God, there was a test that was there. They had the ability to be in human form and actually have human organs and to do what they did. Number eight. There is no Jewish debate on this until the end of the second century A.D. None. This was the belief at the time of Jesus. It was the belief at the time of the apostles. There is no debate. There's no dissent. There is no record of anything until you get well into the second century. Regarding Christian theology, there is no major defense of something other than Genesis chapter 6, supernatural view, until the writing of Augustine, City of God, 410. The year 410. That's the major turning point. Number nine. It is absolutely indefensible that 1 Peter chapter 3, 18 to 22, we looked at it tonight, Jude 5 and 6, and 2 Peter 2, 4, are dependent on 1st Enoch. 1st Enoch has much to say about what led up to the flood and the supernatural component is all over the place there. And number 10, Jude is not only dependent upon Enoch, he actually quotes Enoch. Here you have it, on the screen, Jude 14 and 15. We didn't look at this yet. It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. End quote. 
These writings in the New Testament time stamp the period we're talking about. We saw it in 1 Peter 3. He's obviously talking about Noah. In the days of Noah, this happened. Well, what happened? The sons of God happened. Here's the worship and the supercharging. Jesus Christ smashed the serpent's head. And then he descended and mocked them. He didn't preach to them. He didn't preach to them a gospel. He proclaimed a judgment. You failed. You lost. I'm the one you tried to prevent. I am he. And just as he said on the cross, the last words, it is finished. It's done. When you come into that worship service on Sunday morning, this is it. This is who we're worshiping. The Lord Jesus Christ who vanquished the powers of darkness. We need not fear them. We're sober-minded about them. We need not fear them. Not because of our own worthiness. Because of the worthiness of the one that we serve. He won the day. He crushed the serpent's head. Now, do we have an aftermath? Yeah, we do. I mean, the world is not submitted yet in an outward way to Christ. We know that. But this is what theologians call the now and the not yet. Okay? It's done. It's completed. But it hasn't been completely revealed yet. So we're in that intervening time. But this is a time to take stock on how much God loved you. That you were known to him and this plan was set in place with you on his mind. Every day is a good day. Jesus smashed the serpent's head. May he be praised. All right, any questions? Nadia, we need the mic. I am hot, I'm wound up. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to start with what you ended with. Okay, it's got the green light. Okay, I'm going to ask a question on what you ended with. Because when Jesus, just before he went up to heaven, he said, All power and authority in heaven and earth, earth. has been given unto me. So therefore, go and do all this stuff. That's exactly He's, right. It's, and and it, it, I think it's in, in uh, uh, Hebrews where it says, uh, we don't, all thing, it goes into the same list. All things have been given him. All things are under his feet. Everything is there. It's all there, but we don't see it. But we see Jesus. Those are two different words in the Greek. It's two different C's. One is the, we're not perceiving it. The other is, no, it's right there. We're seeing Jesus. He, we, and so it, he has everything under his feet. So, uh, so the devil is not running free. Just like that devil goes, give me at least 10% so I can do the job you gave me. And he goes, okay, I'll give you 10%. Yeah. He's in complete control. He's in, yeah, so let me speak to that just for a minute, Bob. So, okay, there is this thinking that has filtrated into the church where you have the power of God on the one hand, and on the other hand you have the powers of darkness, and that somehow they war in, in the middle here, you know, and to trying to, you know, get the good that comes out of the whole thing. The biblical picture of this is that it is God that is on top, and the powers of darkness are on the bottom, and God controls all things to work out to an end that he has purposed what is good, okay? Even Satan has a purpose. He doesn't have the power of independent being, there's only one Elohim that has that, and that is the Most High God, okay? So an example of this would be, and for those of you that are you know, sci-fi people, is Star Wars. I mean, Star Wars popularized this idea of the Force, okay? And there's the, the dark side, okay? And there's the good side. It's the yin and the yang. Star Wars is 100% pure Eastern religion. To be specific, it's Taoism, 
Okay, that's what it is. It's just repackaged. Okay, and it has the same idea, the forces of good and the forces of bad. The biblical prescription is a sovereign God who rules over everything. This is why we don't have to fear. Okay? And I think this is the teaching of Job, that even when bad things happen to us, and they happen, the God has a bigger plan. It's okay. In this life, we often lose, but we actually win. Okay? Steve. Uh, up to the next. Can you next? Uh, in, in Enoch, it, it mentions the Anunnaki. Uh, and they was on internet said that uh, in uh, Iran, six months ago, they found a tomb that they believe was one of the leaders of the Anunnaki. So how do the Anunnaki all fit into this? Well, we got a lesson further down the road. <laughs> okay, we're going to look at some of that. Okay? Uh, not specifically the Anunnaki, but there's another group that we want to unfold on that. So, you know. That was another one. Yeah. All right, so I'm hearing something tonight that I've never heard before, so I'm interested. So we know that, or we believe that the particular angels that produce the Nephilim were part of the fallen angels, correct? Part of the one-third. And yet, I see reference tonight that says that they were in their domain, they were put there by God, they were given an assignment by God, they became bored with that assignment, and then stepped out. Were all the one-third angels and Lucifer given domain and assignment? Where are you getting the one-third from? Oh, well, the Bible says that that one-third of the angels fell with Lucifer. Okay, you're talking about uh, Revelation chapter 12. And what we're going to see, uh, Revelation 12, the dragon drew a third of the stars of the heaven. Okay, what we're going to find is, when we get through this, this lesson, is that there have been multiple events of Elohim falling. Okay, we tend to think it only happened once. Okay, but it actually happened more than once. Now, my, my uh, introduction to lesson six and where we were going is that in the primeval history, Genesis 1 to 11, we're going to be studying three of them. Right now we're on two. Number one was in Genesis 3 with what the serpent did. The second one is Genesis 6, and we're understanding that, okay? But Genesis 6 is so important because of the statement regarding the Nephilim and who they are we encounter these same guys later on. And so we have to account for that because the rest of them were all killed. The Nephilim were killed in the flood. Okay? Well, it happened again. So as we move forward, we're going to find there have been multiple times where there have been defections of the lesser Elohim or the sons of God in heaven. Okay? Yes. So then, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. so then what you're saying is that they were not fallen angels at the time that they were in their domain. No. They became fallen when they stepped out of that domain. They chose to okay. leave their domain. They crossed the barrier. They became human in form. Yeah. And they actually made an agreement. I mean, this is this big. I mean, when we get to start studying the geography of this and the way it relates to Jesus and what, everything that goes on there is absolutely incredible. There was actually an agreement. In other words, once came up with the idea and said, everybody was there, yeah, that's good, let's go. Hold on a minute. What if I'm the only one that goes and you guys all back out? They come and they make a covenant together. They actually make an agreement. We'll study it. We'll study it. Who else? So are the ones in prison that Jesus went to, you know, mock them? Mock them. Yes. Were they the ones that are only the ones that created the Nephilim? That's exactly right. The rest of them that have fallen that had not created the Nephilim were still... If we were to believe the full uh, Enochian history there, there's a tenth of them that were allowed to stay in Satan's allegiance. And then there are others 
That also defected at a later time. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah. Last week you alluded to the fact that during the flood, uh, two of every animal was taken aboard along with the eight humans. Do you believe that the, you said at that, that their seed was pure, that's why they were taken aboard. Do you believe the society that Noah came for, his forefathers, were actually more advanced than what we are now? Well, I mean, some have speculated on some of the stuff that they were into at the time. I mean, I got into that a little bit last week on genetic manipulation and some of the things that indicated corruption of the animals and other things that were going on. I mean, I mean, some of that is getting into a speculation, but nonetheless, there's a lot of documentation, not only in Genesis, but also in some of this extant literature that we've been reading, that everything became corrupt. And it's interesting, I pointed out to you that that phrasing of in kind or according to their kind is used 17 times, Genesis chapter 1 to chapter 7, and then it disappears from the biblical record. You never see it again. It's 10 of the 17 occurrences are in chapter uh, 1. Everything was made according to its kind. The next heavy emphasis of it is in chapter 7, which deals with the whole flood epic. The point was that those animals that were brought in were according to their kind. There was no corruption with the goats or the sheep or whatever else ended up on that boat. Then do you feel that the genetics that we are doing now where we're crossbreeding different things? Yeah, I don't, you know, there are some people who would say, you know, I'm not sure that's healthy. You know, we eat oranges that don't have seeds in them. We have watermelons that don't have seeds in them. I, I, you know, I don't know. All I know for sure is that what was talked about at this period of time, what we've got pieced together from some, a lot of other places, it was not good, at least at that time, because it was inspired of the powers of darkness that caused the degeneration of society. I don't know if we can build that case with all of the other stuff that's part of modern life today. I'm not sure. Yes. Okay. They tell us to understand the future, you got to know your history. And then they'll say that history tends to repeat itself. If that's so, and, they, and the scripture tells us that as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be before the return. Are, do you think that we're going to face the same type of uh, spiritual or, or corruption in mankind that was in the days of Noah? I think there will be incredible corruption by the time the Lord Jesus comes back. I don't know. I'm talking the corruption of. Sons of God. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I can't say that, Kyle, for sure. I don't know that. I'm going to build a case that it, it may have been in somebody's mind later on about the possibility of that. But it seems to me that when Jesus went to the cross and died, he defeated the powers of darkness. And so, you know, I don't see anything in the New Testament that says that we need to be wary of this uh, as far as it, you know, being fearful about these things. I think the closer you get to the end, you do have a release. I mean, how could you not look at this this way? The powers of darkness are incredibly influencing culture around the globe, and it's all ungodly. Everybody will say it's upside down. People that are not Christians are looking at things and saying things are upside down. The more you get into something being upside down, you know the powers of darkness are at work. But a specific, as far as the sons of God invading and actually taking over a woman and begatting something, um, I, I, can't, I can't say that. I don't know that. There isn't anything in scripture. I can't say that. I'm just building off of what's already been there. Angels, if we're entertained by angels, and so they have forms here, but we don't recognize that they are that, then the possibilities there. Right. I just don't know, Kyle, if what Jesus did on the cross actually put a barrier up in some way. Again, God could have done that. God could have done that. What, what would have been, as it was in the days of Noah, the corruption event? The, the, it, it would be the, it would be, it would be the, cor the corruption, uh, absolute disdain for God, for his image, for anything that is holy, is right, distortion of in kinds, everything we have going on today. Abortion, transgenderism, homosexuality, same sex, adopting kids, it's totally normal. 
I mean, you know, all of these things. People living together, they're not married, they hop in out of one relationship to another. You got seven out of 10 black children born in this country to, to without a, a father and a mother. I mean, it's the distortion of culture. It's a breakdown of society. It's, that is the work of the powers of darkness. Now here we are in the midst of this, so what do we do? We are lights in the darkness. Amen. And the darkness will hate you. The darkness will hate you. That's right. Remember, one of the objectives of the class is that you would become more sensitized to the presence of temptation. That there be a pause, something to check you in the back of your mind. Like, wait a minute, what is it that's behind this thing that I'm being tempted to do? What kind of wickedness is there that's causing this sense of desire within me to have this thing or do this or whatever it is that is ungodly? What is that? What is the presence of... See, it's all there. Now, we have been sovereignly chosen to live out our lives in this period of time. I mean, and when I ever start, you know, getting wake, quaking knees about what's going on here, I remember it is God's providence that brought us into life now. I mean, we have been given a responsibility in this age, not only to preach the truth, but to do the best we can to train up the next generation to be able to stand in the midst of this kind of darkness. And it is dark. Okay? That's what's going on. Now, tomorrow I get on a plane and I'm headed to Columbia. So we are not going to meet for the next two Mondays. But how am I going to get you back? How, how am I going to get you back if you, if you go, <laughs> if you get back to normal life on a Monday night that you normally do, how am I going to resurrect you after Thanksgiving and your belly's all full of turkey? We are going to examine, we are going to examine on November 27th, save the date, Monday, November 27th, one of the most perplexing passages. I mean, I think that what we were looking at tonight are some of the most perplexing passages of the New Testament. But here's another one. What in the world is going on with Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10? Should women be wearing head coverings? Oh, or not? <laughs> yeah. Your homework is... Read chapter, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And here's what I want you to think about, Sarah. Paul says this. Doesn't even nature tell you that a woman should have her head covered? What is he talking about? What is the argument from nature? I mean, people have been standing on their heads for centuries, trying to understand what Paul said. Generally, it's understood, it's men are in authority over women, women need to be submitted to men. Uh, men. We, we got that part. But Paul adds, you need to have that symbol because of the angels. What is going on there? What is the argument? What is the argument of nature? What do the angels have to do with it? November 27th. <laughs> See you then. <laughs> <laughs>